Okay, well, I'd like to conclude the session um, in the kind of spirit that the previous talks have uh, been animated by, and that is by um, looking backwards at uh, Ivan's accomplishments and forwards uh, towards the continued relevance and implication of that work. Um, I'd first like to round out um, what has already been, been discussed uh, by mentioning um, a couple of other dimensions of Ivan's scholarship. Um, and one in particular is um, his interest, his, his uh, I think, genuine sensitivity to the nuances of language. Um, Ivan's uh, concern for technical precision was, of course, an abiding interest, um, but he was, himself was no technician. Um, and in a different era, I believe he, would, he might well have uh, uh, made his love of Sanskrit a uh, career rather than a hobby. Um, and another, another aspect of his interest that I think is poorly represented in, uh, or perhaps overshadowed by his, his other uh, publications, is his interest in the history of linguistics, the history of ideas. Um, and I believe it's perhaps um, appropriate to try to place some of his work, some of the, his, his contributions in a uh, larger historical context. Um, now, Ivan is principally a syntactician in an era where syntax is primarily concerned with representations, um, and that is my point of departure. Um, modern syntactic theories are largely theories of representations and the devices that produce those representations, but this is a very recent conception, even within the Americanist school. There's no theory of representations in, uh, in Bloomfield, and even the descriptivist procedures are essentially recipes for segmentation. Um, this has an, this, this, this bias or this uh, gap has um, long, has, has, has consequences um, for the representational model that grow, grew out of that tradition. Um, insofar as, as it was constrained by um, unargued assumptions about economy and notions of scientific compactness. And these originally are found in Bloomfield, um, most explicitly in his treatment of, of, lexi of the lexicon and morphology, um, which we can, we can summarize very, very quickly in this, in this quotation here, where he says, our traditional grammars fall short of scientific compactness by dealing with an identical feature over and over again as it occurs in different paradigmatic types, when, of course, it should be noted only once with a full statement as to where it is and where it is not used. So the idea of, of scientific compactness or economy that, that, that animates this tradition is that, in effect, the only thing that matters is the simplicity of the representations and the, or the units and the simplicity of the basic uh, operations on those units. The complexity, the, 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 the complexity of the um, derivation, so to speak, the, the, the combinatorics, um, comes, in a sense, for free. Um, I've just gone backwards. Um, so a Bloomfieldian lexicon consists of ma maximally sim simple units combined by arbitrarily complex rules. Well, this makes its way into syntax, really in the, f at the earliest point, in the transformational analysis of Harris and the uh, cognate model uh, initially in Chomsky, where Harris says the, sen the sentences of English can be characterized by a small family of elementary sentence structures and a, f a few small families of elementary transformations on these, um, echoed in Chomsky's early remarks, we can apparently define a grammatical transformation in terms of a sequence of elementary transformations drawn from a base set, including substitutions, deletions, and adjunctions. It seems also that these form larger repeated units. So scientific compactness in the syntactic domain is achieved within this transformational model by applying elementary operations to simple initial representations. The complexity of that uh, derivation is not relevant to the economy or the compactness of the uh, analysis. The only thing that counts is how, in, how complex the initial representations or the elementary transformations are. Well, one of the, I would say, major contributions of the, of the uh, tradition that runs from uh, generalized phrase structure grammar through sign-based construction grammar is the articulation of an explicit and uh, model of, uh, representational model of syntax with broad empirical coverage. Um, this provides a counterweight to the 
um, the notion of optimization that continues, in fact, to, uh, to govern the assessments of uh, elegance and economy in, in uh, uh, transformation and other derivational um, models. Um, but this tradition at, its out, at the outset faced a fundamental analytical challenge, and that is which aspects of a phrase structure grammar should be generalized. Right? If one were, were cynical, one might regard the original phrase structure grammar formalism as an exercise in planned obsolescence. It was deficient in so many respects, um, respects that coincidentally were overcome by uh, uh, transformational devices. Um, and in particular, phrase structure grammars provide no sin, sin systematic representation of feature information. They even abandon the rudimentary uh, distribution and word class features one finds in Harris. They admit only highly restricted types of constituent structures and exclude entire families of traditional analyses um, that uh, were developed in the preceding uh, structuralist tradition. Well, we can now, at this point, I think, look back to the the impressive descriptive coverage and the formal clarity that's been achieved within the uh, representational uh, uh, approach um, that was, a, was achieved mainly by extending the treatment of feature information. And that's the, the, primary, um, the primary innovation, but we can also look forward to further advances obtainable by generalizing feature and constituent structures in parallel. Um, and what I would like to do now is look at uh, three case studies all of which are significantly simpler than the cases that uh, Garrett uh, has already discussed, um, and all of which I would characterize as the low-hanging fruit of traditional analyses. First one, subject ox inversion. Well, if we look at the GPSG analysis, we, we find that a refined feature classification of verbal elements um, had the payoff uh, in terms of a a much more uh, explicit and uh, broader coverage uh, account of the form and the distribution of, of auxiliary constructions in English. Um, this analysis improved on ways that have been extensively discussed in the literature, um, as I say, on both the coverage and the precision of the affix hopping analysis. Yet, the use of features such as inversion was fundamentally independent about the assumptions of constituency that were uh, adopted in this representation. So it's critical that in a representation of the kind we looked at a moment ago, um, not that one, um, that will is here the head of the inverted uh, construction. Um, it's not critical, and in fact it's not really even very relevant, whether the will is the highest element in this structure or whether we combine the man and arrive into a kind of expedient degenerate clause. Hence, the, tradition, the central insight of the GPSG analysis carries over to an analysis in which the immediate constituents of the, construct, of the construction are, as in a traditional analysis, the man and will arrive. Thank you. Uh, a contemporary version of this traditional analysis is, in fact, expressed um, explicitly within the head grammar formalism, um, reflecting the brief convergence that, Paul, uh, that uh, Carl mentioned in his talk between phrase structure and extended categorial approaches, mainly the categorial approaches that were developed within the Montague tradition. Um, so here we can see that the, the same, the, the fundamental, the, the, the <coughs> insightful use of, uh, of, the, of an inversion feature is preserved in a derivation, well, in a, an analysis which we can exhibit as a derivational tree, as a domain uh, list, or as a, uh, an extended graph. Um, the key here is that will remains the head. The head determines the fact that, in this case, that the, um, the subject is wrapped rather than concatenated to the verb phrase. Um, well, a non-inverted non auxiliary will occur, can occur with a, with a, a basic a su subject predicate order um, in a clause that, as in the, the more uh, intricate cases that Garrett discussed, um, it preserves the uh, media constituent structure, the predicate argument structure as well. Right. So we can turn from this, we can turn our attention to other, what I called earlier, low-hanging fruit in the traditional literature. We notice that a similar kind of generalization permits a phrase structure analysis of, what, of phrasal verbs. Again, we can think of things like pick the cat up as having, consisting of two primary constituents, uh, a complex transitive verb, and uh, direct object. 
again, with particle shift in the cases where th that occurs can be treated as structurally neutral. Well, can be, but why? Um, in this case, we could say that the order is not conditioned by particular distribution of features, but is attributable, at least in part, to structural ambiguity. And that is, we can factor the pattern into fairly, um, we, into constraints that have effects outside this construction. So the constraint in, in question here is, the, is that direct objects in English are, are constrained to follow their governing verbs. On a traditional view, the constructions like pick up had then permit two solutions because there's ambiguity about what, uh, what the verb is in a phrasal verb. If we place the object after the simple verb, we get pick the cat up. If we pick the, place the object after the entire phrasal verb, we get pick up the cat. The order is, is a, an, is a, reflects the interaction of an independently motivated ordering constraint and in what we would say is also an independently order uh, motivated uh, assumption of the um, unithood, uh, which is reflected as well in the patterns of um, agentive nominalization, where we find multiple markers of e mar ER markers in picker upper, not because we're nominalizing the verb and nominalizing a particle, but because we're nominalizing the verb pick and we're nominalizing the, ver the complex verb pick up. Right. As a final case, Let's look, I'd like to look at uh, cases of uh, unlike constituent coordination, picking up from uh, the discussion of Rogers yesterday. Um, conjuncts are traditionally required, thought to be alike, uh, um, and we're looking just at a binary conjunction schema here. Yet hetero heterocategorial conjunctions appear to be possible and are, are as Roger noted, fairly uh, um, robustly tested. Uh, the case that, that occurs in the uh, the papers that I've cited here, um, and is Pat is a Republican and proud of it, in which uh, the initial conjunct is a noun phrase, the second conjunct is an adjective phrase. And the initial GPSG analysis um, accommodates this by positing partially unspecified coordinate nodes, the generalization of the properties, the, the, the word class features of a noun phrase and uh, an adjective phrase, which uh, is plus n in a, in a kind of an XY model. Well, but if we allow reentrant structures, if we're, if we're again thinking of generalizing these class of constituent analyses uh, available in a, in, a, in a phrase structure grammar as well as a class of feature descriptions, these examples can be treated as like coordinate and uh, VPs in which the conjunct share a verb. If we think in those terms, the same analysis will apply to examples of non-constituent coordination, cases in which it's harder to see how an analysis in terms of feature generalization would be made to apply. This, on this generalization, what we find in unlike coordinate constructions and um, coordinations and non-constituent coordinations are directional duals of the right node raising constructions analyzed by Macaulay. Um, uh, the, again, again it, similar to the, the cases of phrasal verbs, the contrasts within this construction type don't need to be stipulated as in, in, the, in, the, in the description of the constructions per se. They are to a large degree attributable to independently validated constraints on word order within English. So verbs are serialized in the leftmost conjunct in a left node raising construction, the cases in which the uh, not, uh, unlike constituent coordination and non-constituent coordination because they must precede their complements in all conjuncts. Complements are serialized on the rightmost conjunct in, non, in right node raising constructions because they are serialized after the verbs in all conjuncts. Um, the, those ordering constraints don't need, those ordering patterns don't need to be stipulated at the construction level. They follow from the fact that each of the conjuncts need to be well, individually well formed. Okay. Um, and the locus of structural, what we're seeing in this case is taking a notion that is uh, uh, a kind of a, a fundamental building block of the feature analysis in HBSG, um, structural reentrancy, and transposing it onto the constituent structures rather than feature structures. Um, by doing that, we simplify the feature analysis of coordinate uh, nodes and un uh, unlike constituent coordination. We 
simplify the constituent analyses of individual conjuncts in non-constituent coordination, and we extend the scope of a standard coordination schema which says that we coordinate likes. Um, moreover, it may be that reentrancies are structures whose time has come. They're assigned to noun phrase constructions in the Cambridge Grammar of English, um, and they're even incorporated in recent minimalist accounts of coordinates uh, questions. So it's a, it's a kind of, uh, it's a theoretical innovation that is um, gaining traction. All right. Well, what can we conclude from these generalizations? Um, well, we see that the research tradition spanning GPSG through to um, sign-based construction grammar has established, clearly, securely established a kind of a representational perspective and, as I said earlier, provided a valuable counterweight to a more derivational uh, uh, worldview. Um, this tradition continues to generate research questions, identify and confront empirical challenges and throw up analytical choices. And what we've looked at today is just a number of really uh, I think um, obvious ones suggested by a parallel tradition that precedes the modern um, uh, modern syntactic approaches. Um, and I'll just conclude now in my to the time that doesn't remain um, and say a couple of things about the the continued relevance of this tradition and, and um, the, I just to to to, to um, perhaps emphasize it. It really derives. The fact that these, this is, there are still areas of, of live um, research, active research interests, derives from two defining characteristics of Ivan's work, um, a dedication to comprehensive coverage and a commitment to formulating earlier proposals with sufficient precision to determine when they might, or they are or might be wrong. Um, so what principle guides the work that we're celebrating here, I would suggest uh, as an some, an, another linguist wrote at a different time and place, the method of rigorously stating a, a proposed theory and applying it strictly to linguistic material with no attempt to avoid unacceptable conclusions by ad hoc adjustments or loose formulation. Um, that was, may only have been a thought experiment for the author, but it is a, um, <laughs> part of the honor code that, that uh, Ivan has lived by as a linguist. Thank you. <laughs> Slide that mentioned Hockett and maybe Gasser on the same slide. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Am I imagining things? No, no, Hockett and Gas. Well, um, Hockett, here's Hockett. Oh, okay. And Gleason, yeah. Okay, but it has Hockett and GPSG. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, before I started my graduate work here, years before I had done graduate work at Cornell under Hockett, and that's where I first started going about syntax. And I went out and did other things for a while, and then I came here and started learning syntax from Tom. And he taught us syntax one out of that major and Heaney's book. And I really didn't like it at all. And I well, does anybody believe this stuff? Eventually, Tom took me to sign, so well, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> and he gave me some, you know, I, I think they, back in those days, they were videos. <coughs> literally millions of Gazdars on published papers, and I started reading those, and I made the connection right away because it just seemed like it was an immediate continuation of Boom, Fieldy, and Linguistics. I had no trouble at all making the transition. <laughs> yeah, I want to give a kind of forward-looking comment here, I hope. Um, you, several times it's been brought up the sort of brief um, merging of the communities of categorical grammar and, and various kinds of phrase structure grammar, GPSG, HPSG, and so forth, and school part. So that's one of the few, not only, but one of the few categorical grammarians here. Um, <laughs> I, I'd like to sort of encourage that there be more um, communication between these communities. And in particular, I just want to make a comment about what you call non constituent coordination, because to my mind, one of the absolute sort of no brainer beautiful things about certain kinds of categorical grammars that's been known since the 80s, work with David Danny, Mark Stephen, and others, is that there is no such thing as non constituent coordination. They all reduce elegantly and beautifully and effortlessly to constituent coordination of lights. And so I'm wondering why, why one might find the re entry, 
the infancy theories more appealing than, than taking that line towards those non-consistent coordinations, which they just fall out of the sky for from that work. Uh, certainly what converted me. Yeah, no, they, um, they fall out in the sense that you, uh, okay, if you have a notion, if you, if you have, I mean, the, if you have a notion of constituency that applies in, outside of coordinate environments and a notion of constituency within coordinate environments, right, that, that's, con that's convincing. But I think that, I think that not, I think what you get in, in these, in these, uh, okay, I would draw a different conclusion, which is that the, categ those categorical approaches show you how far you can go with Basically, I'm trying to say this diplomatically, expedient, <laughs> a, a fundamentally expedient notion of constituency, constituency that you use as a basis for inducing a kind of predicate argument structure where everything, where is everything that, that you care about happens. The, the point is that you, what you think is you can get any sequence of things constituency. That's right. right. And, and, but those things, none of those things satisfy any other constituency diagnostic in the language. Well, so you have one kind of constituent inside of coordination for that, and one though. kind of stuff. But there's reasons for that. I mean, for one kind of constituency diagnostic, as you know, you read in classic textbooks, no substitution by a pro form. Well, a pro form would have to be a lexical category of that thing, and you can sort of, in any case, there's all sorts of things that don't have lexical categories. True, but none. No, there is no other diagnostic that would validate the sequences you get in a category analysis of that kind of thing. So you have elements of question words. Uh, um, you get, but you get a, you get, you get, a, you get a context-specific notion of constituency, which is I think not what people really want from constituents, and shows that you can, you can do, you can do most of the, you can do most of the kinds of processing you want, without, while uh, taking a very, flex, morally flexible idea of you of constituents. <laughs> Do you agree, Carl? Well, it's that moral part. You know, I hate to say it, but this workshop is over. It's so sad. Have a safe trip home, everybody, and enjoy yourself before you actually leave.